Yeah, just to say that we are doing this interview because you're playing on Thursday, on the 2nd of March in Barcelona. We are very happy to, very, very happy to hear that you're coming to the place where I live right now. And more than an interview, I thought <laughs> it would be a, a chance just to chat and talk about your music. For, for me, it was a nice opportunity to to do this also because I, 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 I listened again, went back to the records of Time is a Blind Guide and both of them and heard them like, you know, more attentively with, with the ears that I have now. And I, I enjoyed a lot. I have to say that I have I had heard more Lucas like the second one. Mm. I don't know why why may I thought ah, it's the newest one so it would be it would be better or something like that. Um, but I started from the beginning and listened many times the the first CD, and uh, mm. yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, Thank you. Before asking something or maybe like maybe you would like to share something like at what point of uh, uh what point is the group now what are you doing what are maybe i don't know plans or how is the music um uh, going because i know that you started for example in 2015 with an extended group right with like seven people is it with two percussionists and more yes and yeah. then seeing the piano player, I don't know if the cello player stayed the same or... No, no. it's only actually from the very original lineup, because this was uh, back in the days, back in actually 2013, it was a commission. So I was asked by Fiona Talkington, who is a... BBC radio music presenter in, in the UK, whom I've known for, I don't know, more than 20, 25, 25 years. Uh, she's been very supportive to Norwegian jazz in general, and, and we've had a, a close relationship for many, many years. Uh, she's been very involved in the Norwegian music scene, presenting Norwegian music in, in the UK and on her radio shows and, and uh, so on. And uh, she was curating um, a music series called Connections at uh, the jazz scene, the national jazz scene in Oslo. And uh, she asked me to compose new music for a totally new group. And uh, so that's how it started. I didn't really know whether I wanted a new group and, or needed. Um, but then we had loads of talks and, and she was actually also, um, we were discussing together who to bring in to this ensemble. And it was meant to be both uh, Norwegian and British musicians. And uh, I knew about Kit Downs. And um, so he came up as a suggestion. And then also Kit suggested Lucy Railton on cello. And um, and then in the on the very first concert it was actually Nils Öcklan on the violin and Hardanger fiddle and so on, and Ulle Morten Vågan on the bass. And and then for various reasons the, the band has changed a bit. But now, since uh, the last I don't know six years or so, um, it's been uh, Håkon Åsson on the violin who is on both recordings. And uh, Leo Svensson Sander, who is a Swedish cellist, and uh, Ayumi Tanaka on the piano from Japan, but living in Norway, and uh, and also Ole Morten Vågan on the bass. So this has been sort of um, uh, what can I say? Sort of my composing uh, pool or garden or. What do you want to call it? So it's it's the band I uh, try out compositions, uh, write a lot of new music all the time for this ensemble. I also use it as a base for other commissions I get, either the whole group or just part of the group. So um, for instance, the last year I've been 
writing music for two different uh, dance performances and uh, also for a um, theatrical play. And in, um, in all these projects, I've used Time is a Blind Guide as the base for my music and the compositions and uh, taking them to studio and recorded the music and, and of course then done some after work and editing and such for, for the different plays. And um, yeah, and, and it's, it's sort of my main band to tour with. We toured extensively around, um, yeah, from, uh, from uh, India and Japan through Europe and uh, the States and uh, Brazil and yeah, a lot. And um, yeah, as you said, we've done two recordings for ECM. We were supposed to do another one a year ago and uh, because of everything that's uh, still sort of postponed and delayed because of the of the last year's um, incidents with the, <laughs> the COVID and everything it's been, it's it's taken some more time so uh, we thought actually we were going to this was supposed to be the release tour actually and and then the last message was we were going to record it during the tour and now that's not happening either so Hopefully, <laughs> we'll manage to release new music during the year. Uh, the problem with this is that I constantly compose for this ensemble, so <laughs> we we end up having a bunch of new music. There's a lot of new music, and uh, on the tour we're doing now, we will only present um, brand new music, All right. All right, which is quite different from the two previous mm. recordings. But, but something I wanted to comment, I've, hearing the two CDs, I can feel there's a difference in them in many aspects, but also I'm, I'm like impressed, like like I told you, like I was listening to them like before our interview, like more attentively. And um, I, I mean, I'm impressed by various things. I, I find your music very fascinating. And one of the reasons is that there is some kind of magic happening where you don't know what's going on, but you can feel that everything is in place, but then you lose it again. It's a kind of a game of hide and seek for me. And it has to do with something we discussed in the past about how much things are composed and how much are improvised. Uh, mm -hmm. But then also I, I find that, I mean, in every, every piece of the first, for example, of the first record, there are so many ideas but at the same time, I don't feel, I mean, compositional ideas about orchestration, about the, it, there's a kind of clarity. But at the same time, I don't feel that it, this is working against the music, like m making it rigid. So I, I guess one question I would make is, how do you cope with these two uh, I mean, aspects of music, fixing things and then improvising? Because we know that, you know, when just make improvisation there is this kind of things can be, begin to be repetitive or just a bit chaotic and then when you compose sometimes too much things sound a bit like a bit stiff so uh, yeah, how, how do you see these two elements and their um their dialogue mm. there's many things to say about that just um, um first thing is that when i decided to put together this band, I had a very clear idea uh, of the expression of the band. So I was, um, I was instructing pretty heavy, I think, on how I wanted um, each person to play in the ensemble, um, which is something I've never done really before. But I, I was kind of dictating a few things because I I, th I think I have a strong imagination when I compose music. I, 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 I have classes in composition still with this amazing professor or um, professor emeritus, where he's retired uh, in composition called Björn Kruse, who's an amazing composer and artist and painter and, uh, and philosopher. Uh, and we meet now and then and, and, um, and uh, I've sort of learned that my my strength as a composer is is the um, imaginary side of the music, which is uh, 
uh, which, which makes me kind of hear very clearly the ideas I have. So when I write something, it often turns out sounding the way I imagined in my head. And whether that's good or not, that's, that's for others to decide. But um, I hear the music and I, I hear the textures and, and so on. And uh, so that's one part. Another part is that everything I write is um, very personally composed for the uh, various musicians in the ensemble. So as we've played for 10 years together, um, I know what kind of, um, if I write something on the bass, I know what feels natural for Ole Morten to play. I know what would be natural for Ayumi to play. So when they get the scores, it's, it's not far from their identity or musical direction. And also that makes it easier to work around what's composed. So if they're sort of in a landscape where, or, and also given a role um, and also given a freedom to interpret the music in their own way. I'm very open to their suggestions, their ideas, their way of dealing with the music. And sometimes I might say, okay, I, I want it this way. And other times I say, okay, I'm, I'm hearing this, I've written that, let's see what you can do with it. And, and then diff different persons in the band have different roles and some of them are very active and, and like to, to bring in loads of ideas and, and suggest um, things which I'm, I'm open for, while, while others try to sort of connect more to the music given. But I think um, the fact that um, it's written personally for them and, the, and they feel accustomed and, and um, related in some way to the music and also that I give them freedom to explore the music and play it the way they feel is right gives a lot of freedom and I think on top of that we do something that you know most professional musicians as ourselves we we don't always have much time to rehearse while with this band I like that's something I've prioritized quite heavily you know during the years that we sometimes I just I book them you know uh, like a gig and we have three days in a church and we just work on music and some of the music is pretty complex some is sort of very uh, rhythmically daring some things um, um, harmonically challenging or, or or something might be not so clear that I want to check out and try and, and then we have days of really long rehearsals we might repeat themes for for an hour or two just to get accustomed to it to get to be able to be free and um, and maybe we end up playing it like it's written, but in a sort of open, freely, and um, um, sort of relaxed way. So I think that's uh, that's something I, I love with this band that we that we actually rehearse the music, and when they come to a gig, it's not loads of notes on the stage. They they and it, and some of the pieces are very through composed and with a lot of information. Some of the pieces are very open and it's true. You can't always tell which one is the latter, but, uh, but, lost but the fact that they yeah. actually learn the music. Sorry. No, no. Many times I found myself totally lost, but I, I, what I observed also is that many times it was when I mostly enjoyed also where I, where I just had no idea what was happening. Especially, for example, in the um, in the first CD. On, um, I'll tell you the track right now. Um, the well, in time is a blind guide. The the track that gives the name to your to the group. At some point, I mean, you just 
give up on understanding what's happening. But, uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, I'm conscious of the meter. You have sometimes, for example, uh, in another piece, in the in the fifth piece, you have um, an 11, uh, 11, 8. Uh, yeah. But it is when I'm not counting that I can be more perceptive of the different layers you have and how they interact together, but again, non, not in an analytical way. So it's very just enjoy mm -hmm. just to, to listen just of different things happening. I was listening today and I was also just looking at my window and I was seeing, you know, that like there were some, uh, actually it was snowing today. I think you're coming here. <laughs> is affecting the weather. Wow. It was the first time snow in some years. <laughs> um, and just the Don't do this to us. <laughs> <laughs> it's already melted, don't worry. But I mean just the relation of the of the of the forest with the with the sky and, and it was like three different things that were not related in a first look, but then there was a relation and I, I don't know, I was listening to your music and I had the same feeling. And when I try to pinpoint it, I would kind of lose this kind of magic, you know, that uh, that happens when you hear them. I have the—I don't know if I'm right, but I have the idea that I'm also listening to, um, like, to your idea, like just ideas, and not necessarily numbers, you know. Uh, and I have this feeling when I'm listening to your music that I don't know if it would be right to say that you're trying to defy time in some way. Like just to mm. play around it. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like the thought of you know. First of all, I have a sort of very split personality because in in one way, I'm academic in terms of um, the urge of learning. You know, I like to learn. I like to understand whether that's music or philosophy or what have you. I like to sort of. Uh, learning learn it and be able to express things in different ways you know um on the other side i don't like music that sounds thought through you know i, I don't like it to be sort of smart or in any way academic i want it to be artistically and natural and have sort of a natural flow to it but um I think it, I think one thing doesn't uh, sort of uh, uh, doesn't mean that you have to take away the the other, you know. So, um, as a drummer, I, I have of course worked a lot with polymeters, like polyrhythms and polymetrics, and and such. And I think like that in also in melodies. So if I write in an odd meter, it's never. Uh, it's never to do just with the rhythms it's more to do with the melodies and and that I hear melodies uh, that flows better in that time, time signature it's not like when I start composing I start to write 4-4 four, four, and then and then start writing it, it's always open and then I have to see okay this this melody is not in 4 you know it's th this is and see where the phrases need space, you know, so I make I make phrases and um, I think okay to, for instance, have the next note just after the last it gets too hectic, so we need to put in another note in between, and then and then after hearing the melody, then you have to think okay how how can I notate this best, and then maybe you end up doing it in eleven or thirteen or and it's not nothing fancy. It's not superficial. Or it's it's not like uh, extravagance in in any way. It's just a, a practical way of um, writing it, and it sounds different from writing it in four, because it has to do with where we put the heavy beats and where we uh, sort of uh, let the air just do the job. So, no. it, so it's always facilitating the music and, and not sort of a, a smart idea. And, and just and one th other thing is I like sort of the... Um, I like fooling around with... Uh, what do you call it? When you sort of pull the carpets 
away a bit, you know, so you, you feel that, okay, this is very natural that this happens and then make a variation of just that, whether it's harmonically or rhythmically, that you sort of, uh, you don't know really what to expect all the time. And, and that's, that's not just for the audience, it's also for the musicians in the band, which is, it's interesting to work on. And, and it's also my responsibility to entertain them, you know, to make them play something that they can play in the more childish sense as well, not just musical, but they can have fun with playing the themes and, and it can sort of, the thought is also to write music that generates ideas so that it can easily be a ramp for improvisation. Mm. Yeah, very, very interesting points. I, I was thinking uh, today, listening to your music about something we read with Jenny in, a, in an article about Feldenkrais, where there were diff uh, the writer was, I don't remember the writer, but he was differentiating between complexity and uh, something that's complicated and something that's complex. You're saying that, for example, yes. complicated, maybe it's like driving a rocket or making a rocket, no? But complex is the way, for example, that the hand works. Okay? It has many, many levels of of complexity, but the the functions and what it's the appearance is something simple, no? And I felt that this was happening in the music. There are so many layers, so many things happening, but and sometimes everybody is like <clears throat> adding something different, but it doesn't feel overburdened, it doesn't feel that, that there I guess everybody's listening to what's happening and you can feel that in the music. Uh, yes. I, I was wondering you say all of these things and I I'm wondering, maybe just a very maybe typical question, like influences, like where you, where you, I guess you've played and studied a whole lot of stuff. But apart from music, maybe that else we could talk about that. But influences in the in an aspect of more like books or philosophy or aesthetics or art or something, because I I, I read and you said that, uh, for example, you take elements from Japanese classical music. Are there because I'm, I'm thinking that your music, it sounds to me so um, not similar with what's happening in the, at least in the uh, Central European scene or even US, I would say. Uh, so, uh, um, because I mean, what we were saying before, no, many times, uh, many, many jazz groups or other groups, like you, they use odd meters, seven, nine or 11. And after or immediately or some, after some seconds or minutes, you can feel the beat and it's very rigid, no? And all these ideas that you talk about dancing around, uh, and uh, are they connected with influences from that you would like to maybe talk about? For hmm. I find it hard to say, to sort of, of course, I'm influenced by a bunch of things, you know, whether it's, music or books I read or architecture or dance, which I'm also very occupied in watching. Um, but I think it's all about the same thing in a way. You know, it's just like, um, um, like I'm aware of space, uh, aware of, sort of where people are around me when I walk outside. I'm very aware of rooms that gives me something back compared to being in a crammed bus, if you know what I mean. Like I, I like going into churches, even though I've never been a believer, but I like the space, I like the sort of the, the texture of, of, uh, of, of the work or like like the laudatory where we play in uh, like the, the contemporary museum in Barcelona, which I think is a fantastic um, space. And I remember once being in the, in the art museum in Barcelona, and I'm not sure who was the painter, but I we came into the main hall, and there was just um, and the white the, there was a the big white wall, and 
on the wall there was a black painting and it was oh, it was huge i don't know how many it was like 10 times 15 meters or, or something like extreme <laughs> maybe not that big but it, but it was huge and it was just black and i would see that most people would just pass it looking up and see all that the black paint and i remember standing in front of it and, and looking and as i was looking i could see more and more in that painting that it, there was variations of black it, was, it wasn't just black and and there would be there would be ornaments and there would be uh, you know both um, chaos and something very calm and and there was like a much bigger form than just a big black dot and um yeah, I think it's sort of, it's the same with, if you watch dance, if you, if I read a book, for instance, it, it's a lot about getting into a room, you know, it can, some books can be, have a strong language, they can have a, where the story is not that important. Um, like, for instance, Fugitive Pieces, which by Anne Michaels, which starts with, the word or the sentence time is a blind guide that's where i took the sentence and the name of the band from the whole book is just like a every sentence is a poem and um after reading it like two or three times some people ask me what, what's it about and i, I wasn't really sure because i just read the sentences and and it was just it was just reading the words uh, and the semantics that i thought was beautiful and and it stood out from itself and, and it, it was sort of I could print out so many sentences from that book and just have it on my wall because I, I think I thought it was so such strong compositions in it and and other stories you know they can uh, it, it can be uh, less about the words but more more about the story or um, it can be very colorful. So, so I think it can be expressed in many different ways, but if it managed to capture something, if it managed to hold you in that room, whether it's music, whether it's a dance performance, and, and, and maybe you forget about where you are or whether it's, it's not about, is it good or is it bad? Or what is it about? You know, I was doing this music for this dance piece and after the premiere, a dancer came to me and she said, yeah, she really loved the piece, but she was just curious, what's it really about? And I was like, why do you care? You know, <laughs> well, what was what it about for you? What did you feel? You know, there's no, I could tell you what the choreographer thought, but it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not important, you know. And to, it's just to create a room where you can be. And if you like being in it, it's great, you know. If not, then it's it's not for you. And I think for my aim, every time I make music, when I compose music, is to take myself into that room. And it's not, um, it can easily, uh, when I hear myself saying that, I, I feel it, it sort of gets pretentious or it, it's not like, oh, it's so beautiful. It, it's not about that. It, it's just like, this is a good environment, you know, this, these textures um, has, some, has some qualities. And then uh, you can think, uh, um, uh, what does the music need? You know, like for instance, I never think of my role in Time as a Blind Guide. I never write drum scores for that, which gives me the freedom to not play as you will see sometimes when we play in Barcelona that sometimes I pull out and I just listen and sometimes I feel I'm not needed and other times I play but the music I write it's what's needed that's sort of the the quartet and then I give myself a free role to to color it and and that's also how I compose from textures from themes from rhythmical figures from harmonic uh, changes 
and I see what do we need and, and the violin can do this or the piano can do that and the cello can come in with this and or I can even think that Ulle Morten can add this because he has this quality or Håkon who plays the violin he can he can have this function in this in this piece and then um, still after playing it you know it, it might not be finished and then I I hear other things that I want to add to the piece but it but it's so, so yeah back to what, what you asked uh, <laughs> about inspiration you know there's like everyone else I, I've, I'm listening to so much music um, I would say Yes, I started with being very influenced by Japanese classical music. It's not the same today, but it's it's colored me. It's it's a part of my myself um, as jazz music, as contemporary classical European music, or or electronic music. But also, like uh, I sort of collect a lot of things I hear. Like uh, like now, I'm working on a, on a commission uh, for a festival in Norway this summer. And uh, when I see the notes I've made from when I started to think of the music, it can be like, say things like, uh, listen to the flutes or the flute arrangements on um, the Sufjan Steven record uh, or... Uh, the Björk record, like listen to the, the the way they arrange the flute, you know, that's just to give you sort of, that's a texture that I kind of like. Sorry, and I, it can be like... Uh, the, the, uh, make sure I understand correctly, that's something that you say to the to the musician that's playing, it's an indication for the musician? No. Ah, it's, it it's, an, it, it's just an indication for me that uh, these, uh, that's a possibility I haven't thought of before. It could even be a groove with uh, Kenrick Lamar, you know. And then it can be a piece, I can sit in the cinema and watch the film and in, in all of a sudden bring my phone up and record something I hear because this is this has got a quality, you know. So, so I'm, I'm listening to these qualities and it doesn't matter whether it's um, what kind of music it is. You know, it can be in all genres, and um, all kinds of instruments, but uh, I sort of collect these things and write it down or record them, listen back to them. And I sort of, there's sort of, um, that's all inspiration, you know. So I, I was probably not answering what you were, <laughs> you were questioning, but it's, no, I, I, I think, I think it's, it's hard with, because and also you know when people ask me, you know, coming from Norway with you know we got nice nature and uh, and uh, people tend to talk about the forest and the fjords and <laughs> and the mountains and Jamgalbarek and what have you. And um, for me, you know, inspiration is. I I don't have time for inspiration. You know, it, it, it that's not an active process being inspired. That's being lucky, and you can be inspired by a bunch of things. But when it comes to composing, it's like I set off weeks of time to compose, and I get up early in the morning. I go to my studio. I sit down and I start to work, and that's that's how it works. And if it, I guess, if it goes really smooth one day, and I write more than two bars then uh, <laughs> then that you might call that an inspiring day but it, it, it's actually mostly it's hard work and for most of the time i don't do anything you know other than thinking listening trying and then just a very very short amount of time i write something down and that might turn into a composition Right, this is very good. Yeah, I mean, this is a very, um, very interesting. I mean, when you were talking about before the classes of compositions, uh, compositions you do with uh, that are 
private sets as I understand. So did you do like mm. composition in conservatory or an academy or something like that? Teach, you mean? No, if you if you did the, like uh, lessons, if you learned like I don't in in yeah I I did I did one year of a composition when I studied twenty years ago, mm-hmm. and most of the time I was away, <laughs> I was out playing. So um, yeah, I mostly I've been I've been reading on my own, and I've been asking people. I've been listening, trying out, and just, you know, it also took me a long time to be able to be honest about, or even to call me a composer. I thought that was sort of, I thought I hadn't earned that title because I felt I didn't have the knowledge enough to be called a composer. But then now spending more than half of my time as a musician composing music. I guess that's, I'm entitled to, to be able to call me that. But um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, just as I work once a week at the Music Academy in Oslo as well, and um, it's important to, for me to, to stress that um, it's not like I'm their guru who comes here to tell them how to play and how to do things, but I'm actually there much in my own interests, you know, to learn more and to seek knowledge from them as well as having the constructive discussions we have about music. And then of course, being able to, to guide them and, and give ideas or ask the proper questions, you know, to music. But um, it's, yeah, I, I think that curiosity is, is uh, I have a strong curiosity. I think that's, that's sort of, it's a good uh, tool for my composing. And I'm, I'm not afraid to ask, you know, I can, I can call Hawk on that, I can say, how do you do this on the Hadanga fiddle? Is, is this possible to play? You know, how how should I write this? Or it's sort of totally cool. Hmm. It's very nice to hear you say these things. Also, it feels like in like we said before that in the music, it feels like this kind of openness and like an organic feeling that many different things come together, but in a not very yeah, in a in a in a way that works, it sounds uh, like that. And I'm wondering what ha- I mean. If you have any, <laughs> I don't know if I should ask this question, but you know, in in the world out there of social networks and festivals and genres of music, you find many times the exact contrary, like labeling a lot, just just seeing groups that sell or promote this kind of um, combine this I don't know with that you know uh, and it feels very I mean to me it feels very superficial but also it it's a lot out there so uh, it's related to some something we've been talking about is there something more personal in that or is it also has to do with where you are, where you come from, that because we can listen to more maybe musicians in Norway where they're seemingly effortless or things that work together without feeling like this stress of putting things together that don't really work. So I was wondering how do you, I mean, it it feels very natural and safe and meaningful the way you describe your musical world. I guess the question is, how do you relate with the outside? Do you do you feel a stress when you when promoters ask you what kind of music you play, no? or should I put you in a, or you don't care and just do your thing and then? <laughs> yeah, the the short answer is the the latter. What you said, yeah. I actually don't care, and and it's it feels sort of a bit uh, in one way. Um, 
strange to say that I don't make the music for the audience. I, I sort of, I make this music and the audience will have to come to me. And I don't even feel responsible to be, to having to live up to their expectations for the next, next recording. Like the next recording through Time is a Blind Guide will be very different music from the two previous records. And I'm looking forward to present that. But uh, I, I feel absolutely no pressure. I think people recognize good music when they hear it. And if people think this is good music, then uh, they will like it. And if some people think that this is not music, uh, good, good, good music, then that's fine. I, and I don't lose one second of sleep of that. And I've, I've sort of never tried to, I never, I've, you know, I've never either <laughs> been occupied with earning or fame or anything like that. I, I just, I have a lot of things I want to do, <laughs> you know, and I have a very strong drive to do things in music, you know, whether it's presenting ensembles or compose it's not like i have to motivate myself to get up to write it's it's more the contrary that i find myself sitting in my studio at one o'clock on a saturday and thinking that i was actually planning to go out and have one glass of wine but now i'm just too tired and i need to go to sleep <laughs> so it's, it's actually what i do you know it's i go to my studio and i sit there and and not even work you know i i play i and then i sit and play defender road so or the piano in a church uh, that I have for my disposal or play the drums or, or try to compose something. But I, I play around with music sort of most of my time awake, you know, I either go running or, <laughs> or uh, working on, on music. But I think, uh, what you sl slightly touched there with um, the traditions in Norway, you know, when jazz came to Norway, it, it was, it wasn't like Copenhagen and Paris and Amsterdam where all the great jazz musicians toured extensively and, um, or in general in, in all kinds of music, but now and then, you know, we had Dexter Gordon coming to Norway or, Sonny Rollins or Chet Baker. And then they would play with local guys, which would be like Ari Andersen and Jung Christensen and, and those guys, you know. Uh, and when they didn't play with those celebrities, they, they played with their own mates. And they would come from, um, you know, pop rock scene or, or jazz or theater or they would play in a TV show. They would do all kinds of things. And this led to these guys, the ones I mentioned, and Jan Garbarek, of course, and Teddy Riftal, and then with some neighbors from Sweden, like Pauli Danielsson and Bob Stenson. Um, and also, you know, when Kit Jarrett got his quarter together, that was, that was Bobo's and Jan Garbarek's quartet. And um, he heard that these guys are just very open-minded. And that was just because they, they, they couldn't just live off being jazz musicians. You know, they do all kinds of stuff. So they would play in an orchestra or a big band or theatrical play or a TV show, you know, and do all these kinds of things. And um, when they made music and composed music, it was uh, a result of all that. So it, it wasn't bound to one... Um, uh, stylistic style, you know, it, it wasn't bebop or it, they they even tried, you know, <laughs> but it, but it ended up being a mix of everything, and that was sort of the culture that they facilitated and we inherited, you know, that uh, we can do whatever you want to. You you can just mix. We can have a rock groove, and then we can be still jazz musicians, and we can improvise over that, or we can. It was sort of a very open way, way of approaching music. And that has become um, the Norwegian tradition, you know, uh, which is very small and, and uh, 
but still uh, some very expressive and important figures on the Norwegian scene and, and some of them also internationally. And that was also what sort of brought uh, Manfred Eichel's interest to Norway as well. And, and other musicians like George Russell, who came to Norway and worked a lot with Norwegian jazz musicians and, and also comp contemporary composers. And so I think um, in that way, it's been easier, you know, to growing up in, in Norway uh, in general than coming from the States, especially New York, you know, where you had to know the tradition in and out and you had to be either you were sort of in this game and did things that was right or you were out if you weren't like a pioneer like a few of them were you know but in Norway you got away with uh, you know playing rock in a jazz band or not knowing your bebop uh, shreds so that so we've been sort of fortunate well we see in, in, in just the difference in Sweden and Denmark they're much more straight ahead and much more looking over to the states and and much more influenced by that tradition you know and of course i've got extremely skilled musicians in that tradition more than norway but uh yeah i i i feel fortunate that we have sort of this very open mind set in uh, in norway and do you know maybe do you have an idea why is this difference with sweden and denmark that was geographically, you know, and also population-wise, it wasn't good um, money to come to Norway because few people lived here. You sold few records. There were few festivals, few jazz clubs, few musicians. Uh, Stockholm was more happening. It was earlier established as a uh, jazz uh, metropole. And, um, and of course, in Copenhagen was more in contact with the rest of Europe. So... If you toured and, you know, if Paul Blay played uh, one month in Paris, he would uh, also have a week in, in Copenhagen. But uh, he wouldn't come to Norway or, or not. Maybe, maybe you had one, one date or two, you know. So it was just expensive to come to Norway and, uh, and play. It's like the same or... reason we, we don't play in Greenland or in... Uh, Siberia, you know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yeah, that's very interesting. That was more a local community of musicians that that that, mm. that created or like this kind of. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's still a bit like that, you know. It's still a detour to come to Norway. You know, you. I mean, now people do it more because we have the money to pay people, but. Um, Still, we're sort of on the outskirts of Europe. So the big artists, they, they uh, fly to, you know, mid-Europe. And then you can tour around there. You can drive or take the train. by. But coming to Norway, you can play Oslo. And then you have to fly for as long as it is to fly to Paris. You, you, you just come to Tromsø in Norway. You know, it's the same distance. So... Uh, there's yeah, huge distances and expensive to travel as well. Right. Thomas, I don't want to tire you. I know you had a very busy day teaching today and you have the, your your journey. Um, maybe we can, we can close if you want or we can continue talking. I'm, I'm available if you want. I don't know how you feel. I feel okay. I don't know if there's more we should touch. We've probably spoken for a while, but uh... I, I think many good points. I mean, it, I think it was a nice talk and listening to you. Absolutely, you have uh, great thoughts and questions. So you should be a journalist <laughs> as well. <laughs> what I want to say is that when you were talking about this, uh, your visit in the museum with a very big uh, white wall and the actually it felt a bit like that returning to your to your um, recordings because when i first listened to your music it was i think around three four three four years ago and you know 
when I listen to you in a concert, I say, ah, I like this uh, musician, I like this drummer, I like the, the, the ideas, the sounds. And then I listen to the music and I was like, okay, I know Thomas. It's like, okay, this is his music. But now after, you know, it's this small time and this two, three times we've got together and played, listening to this music again, I felt I opened, sincerely, I felt I opened a box full of surprises and like small or big treasures. Mm -hmm. And like I'm, I'm nice trying just to go back and to uh, like listen again to all these um, recordings. Yeah, really, it was. Uh, and I was also mm -hmm. just paying attention in many ways of how um, uh, how consistent and and and, and, and uh, full they are. Como se llama entero, like uh, complete. For example, I was just checking, like you know, the, the orchestration of the first CD at least. Then it just it's like a you know even the the series of the composition solo with thought. You know, you should start with Tutti and then the percussion solo and then there is a all the comp I mean the composition of the album also is just so well made. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was listening to the first CD, I also was listening to the CD cover, which is very very nice, and I had this feeling of complete. Like with being something very maybe abstract, it was like tied in the music in a very very uh, 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 near way. You know, it felt something very near. Like the same way I could hear the music and don't understand, but get the the poetics of it. It's it the same with the CD cover. Like I, I don't know what it is, but it's very nice and it's like. It feels connected, but then it's, it's something that is different and a, a kind of like a mystery. So I don't know, all these things, it was like, wow, like, I, I have to... That's also a sort of a, an awareness I have when I at least compose music that um, I don't have to, I don't want to dictate too much what people feel, you know, or... I mean, it's it's it can be easy to make beautiful music, but I, I want it to be deep somehow. But but I don't want it to be to dictate people to get emotional or that they should feel something special. Uh, I, I I I'm at least I'm trying to make music that's more open. You know. You know, for me, coming also from a place where. There is like a very, you know, very dance music, very live music. And then the, there is a lot of music, like very, a bit heavy and, you know, uh, maybe influenced from, I don't know, from uh, church music or more like, let's say, Sufi music or whatever. There is many times this feeling that music, to be essential, it has to be profound and heavy, no? And so for me, it was a very yeah. nice, like, just... To, to, to find all this complexity in a music that can be also very deep, but not in the same way, but more open, I would say. So I think it, mm. it, it's very, like, yeah, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, it's, for me, it's a great compliment if people hear new layers every time they hear it, because um, that's what I like in art. That's what I like in architecture, that's, that um, it could be like... Um, brick wall but once you look at it you'll you'll see more and more mm. and uh, i think that's that's a good feeling uh in, instead of being served everything and dictated what to feel and and have all the answers and i know yeah that that was the thing i was searching for um to sort of let people uh not be frustrated but if if uh, the listener can open up and just be there instead instead of trying to get the answers, you know, I, I don't want to give people the answers. I want I want to ask questions. You know, I think that's more profound and it, it's much more philosophical, open ways of dealing with daily life. Mm -hmm. That uh, not not trying to find the answers for everything, but but be aware of the the questions, you know, and, and think the thoughts. But um, it, it's not about it's not about finding the truth. 
you know, it, it's it's not about defining things. It's it's more about having an interaction with where you are and and what you experience. I think that's more valuable than getting the answers. You know. Hmm. It sounds a bit similar or connected with what I think Tarkovsky was saying about his films that he uh, would like people to be particip- partic- active participants in the in the films, mm. not just receive something, but um, yeah, yeah, to, to be active. Yes, it's more it's more contemplation than meditation. You know, it, mm. it's not introvert. It's it's not just on your own. It's it's. Uh, it's it's about starting processes and and being part of what you experience mm-hmm.